You might think that getting into the IT field is impossible without a computer science degree, but Tech Coach Ralph is here to prove you wrong. Get ready for some jaw-dropping revelations on how to break into this lucrative industry. Listen up, tech enthusiasts! Are you ready to break through into the IT field, but feel like you need a computer science degree to make it happen? Think again! Tech Coach Ralph has some exclusive, mind-blowing secrets to share with you. Get ready to be blown away by his jaw-dropping revelations on how to break into the tech industry without a computer science degree. Get your notepad ready, because Tech Coach Ralph is going to change your life forever. Buckle up, 
because you're about to embark on a journey to success in the IT field. Mate, what do you want to do tonight? The same thing we do every night, Pinky. Try to take over the world. Welcome back, welcome back, welcome back once again to Tech Coach Ralph. And tonight we are doing another episode of Q&A. Let's talk about it. So, I'm not even sure which episode we were on. I think we're on our fifth one, maybe. And I've been having so much fun doing this, so shout out to that. <laughs> And same format as we've been doing, uh, we'll go over that. Just wanted to welcome everybody and thank you for being here to all the new subscribers. And let me, where are my notes? All right, so let's get going. First things first, our typical housekeeping. So I want to say thank you to all the new subscribers. Let's go with the ones that I can see. So as of the last live stream, we have I appreciate you. Masked of Tears. Welcome to the channel. <laughs> and we have I appreciate you. Ashish, welcome to the channel. I appreciate all of you. And there's so many other subscribers that I do not see the name of. And I just want to welcome all of you to the channel. And thank you for joining us. We are growing rapidly. It is so much fun. I am so happy that I can add value into each and every one of your lives. And I am hoping to connect with many of you in whatever capacity that I can. I know I have some meetings scheduled with some people, so that is awesome to see. And I just hope that we just keep going and we keep taking off to the moon. So that's that. Let's see. All right. So now we are sharing our live show schedule. Uh, we have, so we have our Sunday afternoons. We have our software expirations. We have our Tuesday nights, which is tonight. We have our Q&A session. 
where um, I go through some questions that are sourced. And if there's any questions in the chat, they get first priority. So um, if you are in the chat, feel free to ask me anything uh, related to the software industry, and we will go over that. And then Thursday nights, we also have software explorations. We've been focusing a little bit more on the code um, on Thursday nights. And this Thursday, I, I mentioned last show um, that I came across this, um, this coding or this automation framework, um, CodeCepts, where it, it integrates into existing um, frameworks or it integrates into like Cypress, I think Playwright, and, and of course, WebDriver. Um, and I want to try to implement it on this coming Thursday, or at least start implementing this coming Thursday. The caveat to that is it is in JavaScript and I've never done automation in JavaScript. So that's going to be fun learning experience. To, uh, so we're going to be using WebDriver in JavaScript and I'll probably take one of the, probably use like one of the sites that uh, we've done in Java or Python. Um, and we'll just go from there and see how we can integrate the code steps with the, with our WebDriver code in JavaScript. So that's tons of fun coming up. Again, Sunday afternoons, software explorations, Tuesday nights, Q&A session, Thursday nights, another software explorations. So that is our live stream schedule, live stream schedule. <laughs> and then we have our pre-recorded content, which is released on Mondays, which is Candid Conversations. On Wednesdays, we have software explorations, concepts, and overviews. So look out for the one coming out tomorrow. And on Fridays, we have our episode of The Bug Bite, where we review software industry-related bugs and how they impacted and affected their company. So we have a very good one coming out this Friday, so tune in for that. So that is our schedule. And last but not least, if, not, if you have not done so yet, like the video, share the video to someone who will find it useful, or who has questions and they want to come on the, or they want to join the chat and ask me a question. And of course, subscribe to the channel and hit the notification bell to be notified when we go live or when we release pre-recorded content, if that is your preferred method of delivery. But if that is your preferred method of delivery, you're probably not on this live stream because you might not like live streams. Whatever it is, however you prefer. Maybe you like it all. I don't know. You tell me. But I am here to serve you. So that's that. And before I get into our um our methodology for the show, just wanted to leave you guys with some timely and useful advice for how you navigate through life. What I want to tell you is that number one, you do not know you do not owe anyone anything unless of course you actually borrowed something from them and you told them that I owe you for this, then you do owe someone something. But don't feel that you are obligated to take care of a another grown adult. If you have kids, you are obligated to take care of them, but they're also obligated to follow what you say. So Anyone you take care of, child or adult, they are obligated to follow what you say, or they can go and find somewhere else, right? And to add to that, if someone is asking you for help, right, you decide if you're going to provide the help and you provide it under your condition. You do not let people who are asking you for help dictate how you are going to help them. Just wanted to get that out of the way, make that real quick, make that real short, make that real simple, right? You're in charge of your own destiny and how you provide assistance, and you do not let anyone take that type of control over your life, all right? So, just wanted to get that out there, all right? All right, so our show, this is how, this is how we're going to run it, right? We're going to set the timer. I'm gonna, let me bring the timer up right now. There goes our timer. And we are going to set that for five minutes. 
And what I'll do, I will read the question and then I will start the timer once we get ready to answer the question. We have about eight questions for tonight. Um, and anything that comes into the chat, that gets, like I said, that gets first priority. So if you're out there, if you're watching, if you're in the chat, connect with me. I would love to answer your questions. But I almost forgot this. <gasps> I almost forgot. I almost forgot. We the best. Look what I have. Ooh. And on the back. What's wrong with it? Oh, can you see it? Oh, trap. So, I just wanted to show that off because we are going all the way in. We are not leaving any stones unturned. We are here to win, right? We are here to win because we the best. The only thing I'm addicted to right now is winning. And it's not only right now, it's forever and always. We are addicted to winning and we put ourselves in the best position to win, right? We do not fumble. We do not miss. We go all the way in and we win. And, and, and we build winners, all right? Not only do we win ourselves, we also encourage, motivate, and build other people who rock with us to win as well. All right? So, I don't believe in no child left behind, but the children who want to win, they are always welcomed to win with us. All right? So, on that note, let's get started because it's Tuesday night and we do not want to be here forever. Okay? Where are we now? So let's see. Let's get started. All right, so let's go. Another one. So this first question is not directly tied to IT related questions or the tech industry, but it is very important as well because it all relates back to something that I've been talking about for the longest time. It's making the proper decisions, not doing what makes you feel good, but doing what is good for you and your future, right? So this question goes, let me start it again, right? Well, actually, no, we're not even gonna press the button. We're, we're gonna go, this part is gonna be included, right? So it says, I have a master's degree and I'm about to be working in a grocery store, All right? That's the title. Actually, wait, you know what? We're going to start this over again and I am going to put the question. I'm going to put the headline on the screen, okay? So let's do this. Uh, where are you? Mm, okay. Let's get this right. Okay, cool. So. We go here and we do this. Let's do this. Ready? Let's go. Another one. All right. So this one says, I have a master's degree and I'm about to be working in a grocery store. Unemployment. I worked during grad school. I had experience in an adjacent field before going back to school. I thought I did everything right. And I still can't find a job in my field. I've been searching for a few months now. I've sent out countless applications and tried to utilize my network, but nada. In case you didn't know, nada is Spanish for nothing. Okay, so continues. The dejection is starting to sink in now. I don't think I'm better than working in a grocery store, but I went back to school because I was tired. I was tired. <laughs> Of working those type of jobs. I want a career and love the field I mastered in. Literally mastered in. Right, get it? Mastered? Okay. Anyway. We're all night, folks. All right. I want to use my degree and work a job I can make a comfortable wage. The last few years are feeling like a waste now, and I have student loans to. So, 
I don't think I'm insensitive, although I might be. But the the reason that I, I play those sounds is because it's like the same story, different person or different post, same question, different story, different post, right? And when I when I was as I'm reading this, I'm like, what the hell is your is your master's in, right? But have no fear. They updated the question with a master's in public health. Yes, indeed. I have a master's in public health. Now, let's think about this. And we are going to get to the question. I will get this off the screen. There we go. Start the sermon. All right, cool. So let's start our timer. Okay. So why did I read that one? Right? It's not even really a question, but you know, some some sometimes there are things that are not questions that have answers. And it's like so many people, it's just a typical story of people go to they spend a bunch of money to go to college to do something that they don't, um, that it makes them feel good, but it doesn't really do much else after, um, for them afterwards, right? And it's like, you, so think about this, right? You go to college, you get, your, you get a bachelor's degree in like something, right? And then you go to try to use it in the workplace and nobody wants it, right? Like you can barely get an internship with it if you're not placed there by your school, so your school system. And, and then after that, you go and you get a master's in it thinking that's going to be different. So that goes to what we always preach is why aren't you doing the adequate research that you need to do to see what is the demand for that field, right? What's the demand? how much you can get paid with it. You know, so like, do you not seek out mentors? Do you not seek out people in, in the, the field to see like, okay, is this something that I should go into? Um, you know, like I can under, I can, I mean, I don't accept it, but I can kind of understand uh, because I think almost all of us went through it because, because we didn't have proper guidance when we were young. Right. I think that is a major aspect that a lot of our parents failed us is where um, they let us kind of like figure it out for ourselves. You know, um, I, I always hear the story about the parents who um, were expecting their kids to be like doctors and engineers and stuff like that. Um, and later on down in life, a after their children like accomplish all those things, and then these children have made like, um, boatloads of money and they're like oh, it, was, it wasn't really what i wanted to do and i'm leaving that now to go and do um i don't know deep sea fishing or something i don't know whatever right shark shark hunting shark fishing i don't know whatever it might be right but they left their lucrative job to go pursue what their passion always was but the key to that is they left their lucrative job to go pursue it so that means they already done stacked up their money in the bank, if they're smart financially, right? Uh, they stacked up their money. So now they're, they're comfortable and they can take some time off. And then, and then, right? If they do take that time off, they still have that education to fall back on. So like now, if they go and they go do like deep sea shark hunting, fishing type stuff, and they like, well, turns out this wasn't really for me. What am I going to do now? Oh, why don't I go back to being a doctor? Right? Like it's, they have options. And a lot of times we don't put ourselves in the position to have options because we'll take these, we'll take these, um, these, we'll take these um, degrees or these majors in things like political science, English, you know, things that like, there's not much that we can do with them. They don't get, they don't get, um, they don't pay much and everything like that. So 
that's the situation we find ourselves in. And now you're like, I, well, well, it's either I do something in this, in this field or I work in a grocery store. Wait, there, there's another option. There's another option is, well, maybe you go and you research what is popular, right? What there's, what companies are hiring for. What's the need, right? The need in the market. And then you learn that. And now in the future, once you are comfortable, then you can try to force your way or you can create your own public health, health job, right? Whatever those jobs are, are like, cause you know what? You might not even end up making, you might end up making the same thing that you would make at a grocery store working in the public health. Maybe you're working at some government community center advising about health risk or whatever it might be. I don't know, writing blog posts, like, you know, and, and then you end up like making less because you, you, you end up with t tons and tons of stress. I don't know. You know, so and, and, and just to just to put a nice bow on this, right there, I came across this YouTube channel of this young lady who, um, as I watched more of her videos, like because she transitioned to QA and she was saying that how she used to be a teacher because she majored in English. Right. And maybe, maybe one day I'll be able to, re like, I'll review that, like that, those particular videos, but it was, I, I just found it fascinating because she made, she majored in English and she said, people keep asking me like, oh, are you going to become a teacher? And she was like, no, I don't want to want to teach. But then that ended up being her only option. And she hated it. Right. The amount of stress that it caused her, it's like a never stopping job. Right. And and then, like, uh, someone that she knew said, oh, why don't you um, try QA? And she pivoted to that, and now she's, you know, working her way through that, right? So the point is, number one, we need to make smarter decisions um, at a much earlier age. Stop wasting all this money on college debt that is not going to pay back itself. And number two, if you didn't end up making the, right, the wrong decision, and pivot into something that is going to sustain you and you don't have to cry and complain about working at the grocery store with, with a master's degree, all right? Because at that point, your master's degree just becomes a nice piece of paper to take space on your wall, all right? So that was that opening one, and we are going to transition to our next one all right okay here we are let's get our next question lined up Let's see if this one's gonna fit in there. I think so. And all right, let's do it. Another one. Oh, wait one second. Before we even get to the next one, let's shout out to Sean. I appreciate you, Sean. Thank you for subscribing to the channel. It is so fun when you get subscribers live on the show. We the best. I appreciate you. All right. Let's get it. So let's go. Welcome, Sean. And before we keep going, Sean has a question, so let's take a look at that. Let's see. I'd say a degree without an internship is pointless. LOL. That is just my opinion. And you know what, Sean? Number one, thanks for commenting. But two, I would kind of agree with you because an internship, like, and I'm gonna I'm gonna give a little story, right? Because someone that um that was close to me, right? A long time ago, or right now, maybe a few years ago, right? Like it was around the time of COVID, and they they were arguing with me that they would 
they would never take an internship if it wasn't paid, right? And I'm like, well, there's there's different forms of pay, you know, because I know nowadays like a lot of internships are paid and stuff like that. But in the past, most in, most internships were like for you, for you out there, right? Who's who is who doesn't has a degree but no job or working at the grocery store with a master's degree, right? The internship was to give you experience and exposure to the working environment, especially in the tech field, right? And this is one of the this is one of the um, issues that I see as someone who's been in the industry for 15 years, right? Or actually, I've been in the industry for 20 years, but been in QA industry for 15 years, and being a automation engineer for the past uh, 12, right? That even like. Even with with QA jobs, they will ask you for a um, they will like they'll ask you for a computer science degree, right? Um, but then like a lot of times, like when you're coming out of college, you don't even know how the like the working approach, logical approach is for working on a team, working on actual production software, right? So. So that, that's the, that, that's the thing. Like, so, and that's why the internship is so important. Cause like where I work at right now, we, we like, they, like we have, we always have interns, right. Um, especially during the summer, we ramp up on the interns and that, like that benefit, like that helps the company, of course, because we have like some more people working and stuff like that, but it, it does so much more benefit to the actual interns because they get to work in a company, see how things are, how things operate, understand like the scrum process to see Jira in action be part of the the scrum ceremonies so important right so like 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 my man sean here says is like a degree without an internship is pointless um because okay you have the degree but you never even put it to use not even for free or like paid but maybe it's not like um it's not paid like an actual full-time employee but still you know what I mean? Like you didn't, you didn't put it to you. So shout out to you, Sean. I really appreciate your comment. And thank you for subscribing again. All right. So let's move on to the next one. Okay. So let's do that. Another one. All right. So this one is straight to the point. It says... How can I get started in QA? What is the difference between a tester, an, a an analyst, an engineer, a software developer? <laughs> a software development engineer in test? What is my career path? And what should I do first to get started? Alrighty, so that is a wonderful question. Let's get our five minutes up and running, and we are good to go. Five minutes. All right, so let's get the question off the screen. We already know what it is. So, all right, so uh, we well, so it's four questions, um, and we're gonna go take them one at a time, right? So, number one, how can I get started in QA? Um, it's if your question is how to get started in QA at an actual company, well, then you would need to do the prerequisite work that I'm going to lay out right now and, um, and, and apply, get your resume right, get your LinkedIn right, uh, so you can actually get your, you can get your, like, so you can get your application and resumes in front of recruiters and different companies. So, you know, and the more you apply, the better chance that you get. Getting into QA itself, especially like if it's um, the level, like the entry level, it's, it's not, it doesn't take that much, right? A lot of companies, they would really, like they advertise for computer science degrees, but you can get in there, you can get in there with, without, right? Um, it's like, like I said, somebody who majored in English, they were able to pivot to um, QA, um, although they're doing manual QA. So it depends on what type of QA you're doing, right? Okay. But to get actually started in QA, I would say that um, they, they don't really teach it in college from what I've seen, right? So you're going to need to at least learn like the principles of QA, you know? Um, and if, if anybody wants to know like a good way to get the principles of QA, 
um, send me a message and we can, and, and I can help you with that, right? I can tell you like what courses I would, I would recommend and give you a plan of action. But yeah, so I would say um, there's going to be court, there's going to be, you need the foundation course to know like all the different types of QA, you know, so that smoke test, regression test, um, beta test, um, black box testing, white box testing, unit testing. You, you need to have that, that foundation, right? You need to have a, an understanding of like, uh, a very good understanding of like user requirements, user stories, Scrum, Agile, all of that good stuff, right? Um, so you need to get started. So that's the number one way to get started. And then as you're learning, you need to practice what you're learning, okay? So, and by that, it's, it's like going to different websites, writing test cases, writing defects. And even, even if they're not like true defects that you're finding, but write defects in the way that you would write them, you know, to get that practice. Because if you, you know me, I always talk about practice. I preach practice, okay? Because the way you practice is the way you're going to perform. And, um, yeah, so then, um, and then eventually, like, you want to learn automation. You can kind of do it side by side, but the most important thing to get started in QA is to learn the foundations of QA, which I do not believe they teach you in, in college. They might do a little bit of unit testing, very, very minimal, because the, what I see, like, when people who are coming out of college, they, like, they barely know how to write good unit tests. So you do want to, um, you do want to get that foundation. And then, okay, what's the difference between a tester, analyst, engineer, software developer? Yeah, again, software development engineer in test. All right. So the tester, they, from, and this is from my perspective, from what I've seen throughout the years, right? Um, and we even had like a one company that we had, we, we actually ended up separating the QA testers from the QA analysts from the QA engineers, right? Uh, the QA, the QA engineers were, they, they were like pretty much on the, they were pretty much as that's right. Um, but I do think as that is different from a QA engineer. Uh, so the tester is pretty much the person who executes the, who executes the actual test cases, right? Um, they, they pretty much follow the, the test cases and they create defects. They, um, they will, once the defect is fixed, they will go through it to make sure that it has been fixed. Um, but to me, and this is to me, that's pretty much the role of a tester. They, they execute tests, right? Um, they are human seleniums or human, human automation scripts, right? Um, and, and they, they can also, and, and that's not too nice, right? Because they do more than that. Because they, they, they actually see things that an automation test can't see, like the visuals and stuff like that. So testers are needed because we're not going to get back into that debate, but they're needed to a certain extent, right? Um, they are not as massively needed as they used to be in the past because we have been able to push automation closer and closer and closer to, um, we've been able to push automation closer and closer and closer to capture more things. and. Every day, automation is being enhanced where it is trying to capture like visual, visual things and misalignments and stuff like that, right? Now, the analyst, uh, what we use them for was to work on the requirements. Um, uh, you know, uh, an analyst is, because from what I've seen, business analysts and QA analysts, they are very similar, right? Understanding the, the user needs, the user requirements, um, being very involved with the stakeholders, writing the test cases gathering requirements like i said um being like being part of the user stories and everything like that so that's what i would say the qa analyst is and it can definitely vary from company to company so keep that in mind now the qa engineer which um i would say it is a combination of tester and analyst plus it also includes the ability to automate the ability to be able to um, engineer solutions, you know, think critically. Because the analysts, they think critically to a certain extent. The testers, very less, like testers, like very, very entry level, right? Um, and don't get me wrong, some companies still use it, but it's very, very entry level. Um, but the engineer, the QA engineer, they need to be able to, um, 
think critically like a QA analyst, have the eye and attention to detail that a tester would, because like even though a tester is going like test case by test case, they still need to be able to um, they still need to be able to see like what's going on. And uh, so, so they, they have to be very detail oriented. So I say a uh, QA engineer has to, be, has to do both, right? But then they also need to know how to, because um, there might be an issue on the site or on the, on the software that you're, that you're testing. And um, the tester or the analyst, they can just report it. But the engineer, I think that makes you a better engineer when you can understand why the problem is happening and that you can understand the conversations that you're going to have with the developers and the engineers who would be fixing it, right? So that's, so that's another aspect of it. Then I believe as well that engineers in the, in the process of creating solutions, they need to understand the problems that either their customers are having or that their engineers are having, um, their software engineers are having, and they can contribute to those solutions and to, um, and, and, you know, it's, it's like, there's even some DevOps involved in, in QA engineering, because I remember, um, I was, you know, I, I use Docker all the time. Uh, I was using a, a software called Rancher where it was uh, managing like our, it's, it's Rancher is like a Kubernetes, right? So, um, and I, I had to get very familiar with that. Um, there's so many different things like about releases or release processes and things like that, right? So all of that is to me, that's incorporated with us, with this Q engineer. And then the software developer, the software development engineer in test, um, what they do is, um, somewhat similar to um to to engineers but i think it's it's a little less where they they are they they are actual software developers right they're software engineers but they have a focus on testing so they might so they might make um things available to let's say to, let's say a company has qa testers and qa analysts who write automation tests but they don't really build a framework the 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 sdet might make things available for them uh, the sdet Will, will maybe they'll they'll be writing unit tests, reviewing unit tests, things like that. So they orchestrate testing needs and contribute like the testing framework and all that stuff. But they they can be like limited to that. They they're not really going to be manual testers and QA analysts and things like that. Um, so that would be the difference between the tester, analyst, engineer, and software development engineer in test. Now, what is your career path? Well, my friend, how do I tell you this? Your career path is anything you want it to be. Message. Right? Um, it's your career path. Right? It's not my career path. I, I, I figured out my career path. I think it's everyone's responsibility to figure out their own career path. And that's why you asked this question, which is very, that's the first step to find out what you're getting into. Because many people, they get into something like public health, and then they don't know what to do with it. Right? So it's, it's a great, it's a great question. You're, but I would say definitely, the, the, which is going to go into the fourth question that you asked, what should I do first to get started? The first thing you to do as part of your career path is, if you have not done so yet, take a well, no, 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 rewind, rewind. The first thing that you do is subscribe to Tech Coach Ralph because I will give you valuable insight on how to navigate through the tech industry and specifically the QA field, right? So the next thing that you do is subscribe to Tech Coach Ralph. No, I'm kidding, I'm, ki I'm kidding, okay, all right? All right, all right, give me a break here. All right, so, but definitely the next thing that you do is you get familiar with the QA principles, right? The foundation of QA, learning all the different types of testing, how to write proper test cases, how to write proper defect reports, um, how to be, um, so all of that, right? You need to get that foundation of QA, right? So that's the first thing to get started. And then you also want to, um, you also want to um, like make sure you have good communication skills, written and oral, right? So I would say those are the first things to get started. And then I would highly encourage you to learn um, automation, learn a coding language, um, and that's the start. But you, you do want to get well-versed in multiple coding languages, multiple automation frameworks, all right? And on this channel, we will definitely do that because I have plans to go through Cypress. I have plans to go through Playwright. I have plans to go through Detox, all right? So 
follow along and we will get there. Uh, oh, and we have Sean says he's adding. I love it. Sean is adding to the conversation. He says solid foundation is a must. Exactly. Shout out to you. <laughs> Especially during the interview. And that's the most important part, right? Because um, I think I said this um, on last show is that you must be, like, you, you can have all the knowledge in the world. And this is for anything in tech, right? You can, you can have all the knowledge in the world. You can be a genius in tech. But if you can't articulate what you know, you're not getting it. Right. So let's say, let's say, let's say they give you a, um, a coding interview, right? Like, or coding project. And now you write the project and, um, and, but now they ask you to explain it and you can't do it. You're going to like, Oh, so, so you didn't, you didn't do this. Somebody did it for you. Right. You got to be able to articulate. Right. So that is, that is, um, what I would say to that question, right? How to, how you can get started, the difference between tester, analyst, engineer, as that your career path and oh to add real quick your career path so yeah um you get you, st you get started by um getting the foundations right getting good communication skills um and then become a qa maybe tester analyst something to that extent entry level you learn automation um and you become a qa engineer and you just keep learning learn different languages learn infrastructure learn about aws you don't need to be an expert in any of those except for um automation right you do want to become an expert in automation but you don't need to be an expert in all those other things you just need to know enough to be dangerous and that you can learn more um when necessary because that's what i do right i'm not an expert in aws but i can navigate around it i can research um to see what i need to do so that is i would say that's your career path and then you can go and there's like in qa like um the way that my company structures it like there's like qa specialist qa engineer level one QA engineer level two um level three and then you have the senior qa engineer you have lead queue engineer, and then you have a staff queue engineer, and then there's directly, right? So there's like, so there's like a whole pathway. So that's the career path for individual computer co contributors. And there, there can be a, a manager, um, senior manager, like so many different things. So that is, that would be your career path um, if you want to go down that path. So great question. And um, I know we went a little bit, or we went much longer on it, but this is a very important and foundational question. And it kind of applies to most skills in, in tech, um, but this one is specifically for QA. So shout out to that question. <laughs> All right, so let's get ready to for our next question. Uh, okay, so we will do that. Let me get the question up on the screen. And where's my water? I need a, need a sip. We'll have the fancy cup tonight. It's pushing through, you know? All right. So let's go with this question. All right. Let's go. Another one. The headline for this one is writing test cases for catching a lot of bugs. All right. So behind the paper. Oh. So it says, what kind of mindset method best practice would you recommend for manual testers for writing functional and non-functional test cases that kind of that kind of think outside the box in order to catch more bugs than before? Besides going through happy path and known edge cases and error handling scenarios. And they give an example. Example, you don't have access to the source code. The requirements docs are not up to date. How would you come up with new ideas for making your test effective? All right, so that is that question. And let's get it off the screen. Bye. All right, so timer up and let's get at it. All right, so. Mm, this one, all right. It's kind of tough for me to answer this question because I don't like the premise of it. Um, and why don't I like the premise of it? There's a couple. There's a couple of things that that come along with this, right? The 
I don't, and maybe it's, maybe it's a manual testing thing, or maybe it's, it's, it's like me that's been in the industry for so long, but I don't like the idea of writing test cases to catch bugs, right? I like writing test cases to ensure that our software is functional. All right. Um, and if I think so going with that, I think the bigger problem is what you stated later, like in your example is that not having, so not having access to the source code, eh, that's not that big of a deal because um, even if you did have access to the source code, one, you might not understand it Two, it might not necessarily be relevant um, to your testing. The problem, but the bigger problem I have is the requirements docs are not up to date. Right. And, and my question to that is why are they not up to date? Um, and how much, what role do you have in and what not, not not necessarily role but like what impact do you have to the team that you um like is your voice not heard that like okay oh, hey um in order for us to do to create test cases we need to have updated requirement docs we need to have good user stories um you know are you using are you using agile methodology are you are you on a scrum team because if not and and you end up having um requirements documents that are not up to date then maybe you should try to, maybe you could suggest like, Hey, um, should we shift to, can we shift to a agile environment so that we can have up to date user stories and requirement docs and everything like that. And who's the owner of those requirement docs to make sure that they are up to date. Right. Um, so that is, that's the first thing I want to address. Right. Um, now the reason that I, I say I don't like writing test cases to catch bugs, but I rather write them to validate the functionality of the software is because I think for a long time, QA had a bad rap of um, being bug hunters, right? Like we were, um, like we were uh, the Orkin man, remember Orkin man. So, and, and we're just going in there and we're, we're looking for, 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 termites in the bug and termites in the code or in the software and all this type of stuff. Right. And I think that that gives us a, a bad, um, I think as a Q engineer, it gives us a bad way to look at it. Um, and I like to work closely with the, with the engineers, the software engineers, so they can have a better understanding of how I am approaching the software, how I'm understanding the software and that, and how I'm going to approach the testing. And when they have that in mind, right, they, they, so now when they're developing, they know what QA is looking for. And I also, and I also have what they have in mind. So maybe I have gaps in my thinking and maybe they have gaps in their thinking and we put it together and we become as gap free as possible. So, so that's, that's why I have the issue with writing test cases um, for catching a lot of bugs. Test cases are not meant to catch bugs. They are meant to, test cases are meant to show you how, like, it's meant to show you how the software works. One of the biggest things I use test cases for was when I was onboarding new QA um, testers or analysts or engineers, whatever it is, it was a good reference for like, oh, go check out these test cases and and go through them so you can have a good understanding of how the site works, right? Now, test cases do find bugs, right? Don't, don't get me wrong about that. But to me, that is not their intended purpose, right? So that's why I have a, it's hard to answer the question based on that framing, okay? So I think I already covered like some of the best practices. Um, and I, I don't think it matters whether you're a manual tester or, or anything like that. Now, the part that, could be tricky is if you are a manual tester who is a contractor who doesn't necessarily have access to the to the developers, right? Um, then you might have an issue. But I still don't think that you're writing test cases for catching bugs. You're writing test cases to test the functionality, right? It's you're testing the functionality of the software to validate that the software is working as expected. So, you know, and one of the things that like that. I think was a mistake initially in QA is that you were rewarded for the amount of bugs that you would find as opposed to 
the software, like the focus being on the software working as it should be, you know? And I, I, I do think that uh, the, the whole, the way that Agile shifted it, um, it, it makes it more focused on the functionality of the software and not necessarily um, as many bugs that you can find. Because when I think about the waterfall method, right? Um, all the, like QA comes in way at the end. And so all the development is done. And then it's like, all right, here's, here's the, the months and months of, of, of um, work that we've done from my engineering end. Now it's in your court, hack at it, right? And then like, we'll just go oh, bug here, bug here, bug here, bug here. And because that we work nowadays in small increments of code, small chunks of code, we can, we can get involved a lot earlier. And I think that we should, we should not be waiting. We should never wait until code is implemented for us to start getting involved. We want to get involved as early as possible so we can reduce, and I say reduce the amount of bugs that we find because we want to go to market faster, right? Because if, if, if I'm company A, right? And I, like, I say, all right, this is ready to be tested. We're ready to deploy. And, and QA is like, oh, no, we have like 10 bugs that need to be fixed, right? Company B, who is my competitor, they started testing a lot earlier or getting the testers, their, their QA engineers involved a lot earlier, their QA testers involved a lot earlier. They are able to go to market way before me. And now they get that market share and I'm left pulling my thumbs, waiting for the engineers to go and fix the issues, um, to fix the bugs. Right. So that's what I would say. It, it, that is, that's a very tough question to answer because I think it takes a fundamental shift in thinking and I think that QA engineers are evolving towards that thinking, but in certain places um, where manual testing is a big thing, that mindset shift is going to take a little bit longer. So that is that question. Let's move on. All right. All right. Next question. What do we got? Oh, that's a good one. Let's see. Oh, All right. Oh, let's see. Let me check out Sean real quick. Shout out to Sean again. Sean asks, what are your thoughts when it comes to AI and QA, such as chat GPT, uh, uh, Bard, et cetera? So I'm not too familiar with Bard, but I will make a note of that to look up. Let me just put that in a Google search real quick so I can remember to look that up after the stream. And, but to answer your question specifically, um, and I'll, you know what? I'll put a five minute on this one. Uh, so that's your question specifically, Sean. Um, it depends to me what the AI is being used for. Um, like, I'll put it like this. A lot of the stuff that I do on YouTube, uh, I, use, I use a lot of AI as my personal ex um, assistant, right? It is um, it's me who's thinking of, of all the things, and I'm pretty much dictating uh the ai what i want so like it might write me uh, descriptions it might write me titles but i'm giving it the general idea and i let it come up with something better right um so it's like i'm using it as a copywriter you know um and then put things like that and using like templates and stuff like that so i think that ai is great but it depends on what you're using it for and in a i think in last week's q a right there was and I, maybe this video I think this video is coming out either like, I think it might be coming out on Thursday, right? Uh, of one of the questions that we had uh, a couple of weeks ago. And what I think about, what I think about AI is if you're using it to like do your work for you, like let's say you get a job through like fully through AI, you don't know anything about what you're working on, but because AI gave you all the answers and everything like that, um, then you put yourself at risk because what if you get to a point like to so something like you, what if you need to do something and what if AI gives you the wrong answer or it, it can't do it or whatever right um then you put yourself at risk where you get exposed and now you're seen as a fraud like i don't believe that you should ever lie on your resume at a job or anything like that right you, you shouldn't be lying in general but 
you, you, you see what I mean? Um, but you being used like if if you use AI as a personal assistant, right? And and that goes to say, like, um, I don't think you saw this at the beginning of the show. Um, on Thursday's live stream, uh, Thursday night, I'm gonna be trying to implement um or starting to implement a library called CodeSeps, where that uses AI inside of their in, with QA automation, right? So we're gonna take and use and does it with JavaScript. So JavaScript is gonna be new for me for automation, but that's gonna be fun. But I'm gonna be using uh, the JavaScript um, version of Selenium WebDriver and integrating CodeSeps in it. Uh, which is supposed to have AI, which I think is going to be amazing. And then on our Sunday shows, where we're implementing Report Portal. That also uses um, some, some some AI to be able to understand the um, the run results and the metrics and everything like that. So and, and it even has it like we can auto determine what the cause of uh, a test failure was. Like it, it learns, right? Um, so I think AI is very very useful, um, but you got to use it the right way. Like you, you still, I don't think it's really possible to use AI if you don't know what to ask for. Right. Um, and some of the things that I see is um, like, if you feed, if you, if you feed AI the wrong information, then you're going to get you know, bad data in, bad data out, good data in, good data out. Right. Same, same thing. So, so that's, so that's what I would say when it comes to AI and um, when it comes to AI, and QA, right? It can be super, super useful, or it can be your worst enemy, just like robots in um, iRobot with Will Smith, right? Most of the robots were trying to kill him, and he had one that was on his side. So, hope that. Uh, um, let me know what you think about that. Um, that's that's how I see it right now. Um, but I haven't really delved too much into uh, AI and QA, which we're going to get that started on Thursday. And I believe that I, I believe the the um the code steps uses open AI. Uh, I think it's open AI. And it can either use like the I think 3.5 version um or the 4.0 if you if you pay for that subscription. I I I read the documentation, but I don't remember the exact details. But definitely let me know what you think. And um after this question, if you have responded, then then I'll read that and we'll go from there. All right. So that is my thought. Shout out to that amazing, amazing question. All right, so let's get into the next question. So let me pause that. All right, so this one said, so the headline is, hi y'all, I got, in, I got an invite for interview with the CTO for a final round. What can it involve if you have experiences in these rounds? My position will be a QA engineer. How can I prepare to crack it? Any tips? Well, I am glad you asked. That is an amazing question. All right. So let's get to it. All right. So let me get this off the screen. All right. So let's start our timer. All right. Now you have an interview with the CTO. First and foremost, congratulations to you. Shout out to you. I don't know how many rounds your interview process was, but getting to the CTO, like you should be proud of yourself. That is, um, there, like, there are countless people who apply for QA jobs. Um, and like when, when, when you see us on our live streams and we review or reviewing jobs on LinkedIn and there's some jobs that have like 12, hundred people who are applying for it, 500 people who are applying for it. Uh, so number one, getting the interview, that's, that's the, just getting the interview, right? That's an amazing task. Getting past the recruiter, HR, um, getting past that, uh, getting like a meeting with the manager and meeting if you meet with a team, like however many rounds it was, congratulations. That is amazing that you got that far. And, um, and now when you're meeting with the CTO, Usually, like they might throw in some technical questions here and there, but usually it's it's more of a um to see if they like you really, right? If you if you would be a good fit, um, is you know um crossing T's, dotting I's, or dotting T's, crossing I's, or whatever, you know, um, it's really to see it's really to see um, it's like that it's like that final layer. Like if you if you get all the way to the CTO, right? 
it's your job to lose. Message. Right? What do I mean by that? It's, it's your job to lose because that means everyone before that, right? If you get to the final level, that means everyone before that gave you a thumbs up. I mean, not necessarily everyone, because sometimes like, you can have like five people give a thumb up, one person gave a thumb down. And like, yeah, okay, we're, we're, we're going to go with it just because who knows why. Like maybe you said one thing in an interview that they didn't like, whatever, right? But for you to get that far, that means you had overwhelming support by all the people who interviewed you um, before, right? So it's your job to lose. Like, are you going to say something stupid, right? Stupid. Are you going to say something stupid there? Or are you going to, um, you know, whatever it might be. Like, it's your job to do is if you can get that far. And um, I would say to prepare for a QA engineer interview with the CTO, you want to be, you want to make sure that you can communicate. That, I mean, and for you to get that far, you probably have been communicating well, but, you know, communicate well, articulate yourself, be concise. Um, make sure that you know about the company that you're interviewing for. Right. That's very important because they, like they always ask, like, what do you know about this company? Um, and, and sometimes like, right, it's, it's hard to, some, some companies, are, they can be so niche or that they they're involved in different things that it's hard to have, a, um, to get a full grasp of what they're doing but for you to get that far. I'm sure someone would have explained it to you, what you, what, what that company does. So it's really about your personality is going to be right. They, they might throw in some technical questions here and there just to, to make sure that you didn't get past, you weren't like fraudulent, get, get past all their, the security barriers, but it's not going to be that many, maybe one or two at the most. Um, but to see like, and, and they're going to be looking at like, how do you think, right? Um, are you a team player? You know, are you going to add value to the company or are you going to detract from the company? Right. And I think that, um, and I think that you getting that far, the, like they already have all the documentation to send you that, that, that offer letter written up and everything like that. Right. But you know, you have to like they, a lot of times, um, and, and it's not all companies that you meet with the CTO. Cause like some companies you might meet with, like who's going to be the, who's the director of, of, um, QA, or you might meet with, um, whoever, right? Like it, it, it depends who you'll be meeting with, but I would say that, um, be personable be yourself. Um, you know, don't, don't be like a brick wall, like no personality. You know, um, be light, be agile. You got that far. It's your job, right? I'm, I'm telling you right now, it's your job, right? And you will either, um, it's, it's your job to lose, right? And so it's your job. Like you already have the position, but you're the only one who, who can, you're the only, the only challenge is you to put it that way. So that being said, um, I, th I think you have, I, I think it's a done deal. You have a good chance. Um, don't be worried too much about it. All, like the hard parts where when you're meeting with a team or your manager, uh, where they were, at, um, or if you had a technical project and they were really drilling you on that. So I think, I think you have a good chance. So, um, I, I think you're going to do just fine. All right. So that's that. Uh, ah, we didn't even start the timer, but that one wasn't too long. So <laughs> that. great question. And I am so proud of you. That's all for you, buddy. All for you. All right. So let's continue. Mm, all right. So let's get rid of that one. And Sean, if you are around Thursday night, I would love to have you in the, in the chat as I work through code steps. Um, you know, it's always amazing. It's always great to have a second pair of eyes. Uh, cause like <laughs> on, on, of uh, the live stream last Thursday or not last Thursday, but Thursday before that, like, I, I, like something so simple and obvious. I was like, once I figured it out after the stream, I was like, stupid. You know, um, but you know, like, and if you are in QA or QA engineer, um, I, I love working QA engineers and collaborating. So if you are able to be there, you are more than welcome to be. So we will see. All right. So, oh, this is a 
It's a juicy one. All right, so let's get that question up. And we shall continue. Another one. This question is straight to the point. If devs test their work and automate tests unit to end to end, why would they still need a QA or QA engineer or quality, a quality, these people in their wording, why would they still need a quality, uh, a, a QA engineer, right? So, hmm. Hmm. things that make you say, hmm, right? So, Let's get that off the screen and we will talk about it. All right, so devs testing their work. Um, number one, everyone should test their work, but, and, and devs like, so unit test and to end, I, For that particular company, right? If devs write unit tests and they also do end to end tests, um, then they. No, actually, no, uh, I'm wrong on that. So let's take that back. Why would they still need QA? Right? Well, the reason they need QA is because devs are not Q, devs are not quality assurance engineers. They're not. QA testers, they're not QA analysts, right? The closest that they probably are, are SDETs, right? Because they are software developers, they're software engineers. Um, and if they wanted to, like, I mean, they can um, think of, like, they can create tests because they're software engineers, right? Um, but they do not have the, like I said, in college, you do not take the print, like, there's not a course at, that I know of, at least, that's called principles of quality assurance right most people get out of college and like we read last time um they don't even know what qa is right they heard about it in college but they never thought it was a thing remember that question right and we are starting our timer for real this time almost missed it again um so they 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 don't have that foundation right so that's the, that's that's the number one thing they don't have the foundations of qa they don't like they know, like, they know about the, um, which one is it? Either black box or, or white box, whichever one is testing. I always, I always get too confused. I, th I think it's the white box where, you know, the internal, um, structures of the code, right? Um, but, but, uh, so then that would be like their unit test and their, their in integration test, right? But, um, they do not know, like, they don't write test cases. They don't know, um, like, how to properly analyze and to think. They, they can think critically through, um, through their code and their engineering for the software, but they don't have that critical thinking for QA. And one of the main rules in um, development and, and QA engineering is you do not test your own work, right? And Yes, you do test your own work. You do test your own work, but that's just for you to make sure that you like you are meeting the the requirements, right? But it's not like you you don't you don't test your own work in a sense of approval, you know? Someone else has to sign off on it, okay? So So with that being said, that is the that is the the first and foremost primary reason on why you would still need QA, um, like, and why you need QA engineering, right? Now, the next thing is, if the, de if the devs are writing unit tests all the way to end-to-end -end tests, right? And everything in between. So they're writing the unit tests, they're writing API tests, they're, writing, they're doing the integration tests, they're doing the end-to-end -end tests. They're also developing, God forbid they develop, right? No way. So they're developing the, 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 the code for the software. They are um, now they're, they have to test their own code, right? They're writing the unit tests. 
Now they have to test the business logic, usually through the API test, right? And then they have to test the, um, they have to test the, uh, like the actual UI. And so they're writing end-to-end -end tests as well, right? So you would think that they don't need any QA, but then who's going to, who's going um, to, if you don't, like, so let's say we don't need the QA, right? Because you're doing the unit test, all this end-to-end -end test. Who's going to develop? And when do you ever plan to go to market? If you think about, if you think about what I said um, earlier, right? When, when um, mark, company A and company B, right? Company A and company B. If, if company A, you find all these bugs, right? But company B, they, they did the QA a different way and they were able to avoid all these bugs. So like company, company A finds 10, company B finds one minor bug where they can either um, fix it later or they can fix it now, whatever, right? They get to market faster, right? In the same situation as this one, if the developers are doing everything, right? So they're developing the, they're developing the actual software then they're writing the unit tests, the API tests for the business layer, the business logic, and then they're doing the end-to-end -end tests, right? For the UI and stuff like that. Well, how, like, it's going to take forever. You got that forever for the software to actually get to market because they have to worry about everything, right? And that's another reason that you have QA because if you do QA the right way, right, and you are starting QA earlier, you're shifting left, you know, you're involved at, you're involved to give that, to give the, um, to give the QA engineers, right? Or I'm sorry, not the, give the software engineers a quality mindset so they can write their development or they, so they can write their code with the mindset of um, what QA is going to be looking for. Right. And then once they finish that and they give it to you for testing to, for validation, right. And you're writing your automated test. So you can, so, so now you, you can take care of the API test. You can take care of the UI test, right? Guess what the developers get to do? Hmm. What is that? What do the developers get to do? The developers get to work on the next story that needs to be developed. The developers get to move on. And now if you find a bug in what they worked on, they can go back and address that. But you can get to market faster because if you, if you did QA the right way and you started early, there's going to be less chances of bugs, especially high risk bugs, right? And the developers get to move on and start on a new story while we're finishing up the current story. So that is why it is important to need for QA, it is foolish to have developers to like to write the code and then to like the unit test that definitely belongs to the developers, right? To the engineers, but anything like almost anything after that. So, um, and even like load testing, right? I think the load testing should also be on the um, on the QA, right? Um, or per, there's also like some companies that have performance engineers that it could be on them, right? But the um, the business layer, like the the business logic, the API test, end to end test, that should be on QA so the developers can start moving on and QA can do all that other part, right? And that's why it's important to have QA and not put all of that on the developers if you actually want your company to be successful and to grow and make money, right? Because get rid of the developer, the QA then eventually you're going to get rid of the developers because the company's going to close. All right, cool. So that is that. Let's move on. What is the next question? All right. Ooh, we have our good friend, good pal. Melissa says, hi, tech coach Ralph. Hi to you too, Melissa. <laughs> Welcome to the show and to the chat. Ow. 
appreciate you. All right. So we are going to move on to our next question. And let me get that up for you. Mm, that's a long one. Let me put, all right, we'll put this. This one kind of follows along uh, similar lines to what we've seen before, but it is still a very good question because it is slightly different and it is going to be very, very useful. All right, so let's do this. All right. And let's go on to our next question. Another one. Headline for this one. Hello. Hello. I need advice on what to do next. I completed my software testing course. All right. So they need advice on what to do next. And let's read the question. It's after my bachelor's in computer applications, I did a course on software testing for seven months. I'm pretty good with manual testing and automation, Selenium with Java. I'm in the search of an automation job. So I worked on a small project, created test cases and automated. What else can I do to improve myself? Is it important to have theory, knowledge, or hands-on experience? That is a great, great question. And I'll be glad to address it. And I will go to your comment after this question, Melissa. All right. All right. So to answer your question. So before we get into that, right? I just, wanted, I just wanted to make something very clear, right? So this person, they completed their bachelor's degree in computer applications, right? But they still had to take a software testing course for seven months. Like I said, although it is not that hard to transition into software testing, right? College does not prepare you for it. It might give you, it might put you in the industry, um, write, have you writing some code and everything like that, but it does not prepare you for software testing. To be honest with you, it barely prepares you for software engineering, right? Um, like I said, when I went to college for computer science, um, I was so unprepared for it. I didn't like. I just I, I couldn't stay in there because I was so unprepared. Didn't know what I was getting into, and they had us coding in um, C plus plus. Right. Um, so, yeah, just wanted to reiterate that after this person completed their bachelor's in computer science and computer, computer applications, they still, right, still had to go and take a course on software testing for seven months, which I mean, they paid more money than their expensive college education for that. Right. So, um, this person said they, they worked on a small project and created test cases and automated them. That is awesome. I would say as well to improve. So work, don't just work on small projects because you can like, you can find a project that somebody has for you to work on, but this is what I would say, right? Um, first and foremost, I would say create a QA portfolio. Um, and I can get into that, uh, later on what that means, but you want to, um, don't only work on small projects. You want to work on, um, take really popular sites, all type of sites, right? So take a site, uh, take a site, um, in the airline industry, right? So like a JetBlue, a Delta, do Spirit, do American Airlines, whatever it is, right? Um, to do Travelocity, which that one is very good because, um, it has different industries. It has airlines, it has flights. I mean, oh. It has airlines, it has like so flights, right? It has hotels, it has the packages, so like vacation, but so many different things that you can automate, right? And use that as a good opportunity. So sites like um sites like um Travelocity, Expedia, all those type of things, right? Uh, like write test cases for those and automate those, right? And write defects for them too. Even if it's not a real defect, get the practice of writing defects so you can actually show 
um, perspective, um, perspective employers, how you write your test cases, how you write your defects, how you write, um, and how you write your automation, right? So take that, take, so take that from different industries, take e-commerce, right? So there's ASOS, there's Abercrombie and Fit. There's, um, there's Amazon, there's Best Buy, um, there's Walmart, right? Work on automating, like, I'd say five to 10 different flows for each of those websites, right? So that gives you, um, so let's say you take a um, hospitality industry, e-commerce, right? Um, what else? <sighs> Banking is kind of hard to do because of all the security in encryption. So it's going to be kind of hard, but you can take a bank site and then navigate um, like the outer portions of it. Like let's say um, creating an account where you like fill out the form and stuff like that. that. That's, that's another excellent opportunity to automate, right. And to write test cases. And, and you can actually, even though you can't automate much inside of the banking website, you can still write test cases and write defects for it. Right. So, so get, if you write, like if you take like five different industries and you do five to 10 test cases, right. It gives you 25 to 50 test cases that you can, write, like, so test cases you have, and then that you can also automate, right? And then let's say you write three defects per site, that would give you like 15 defects that you can show. And then you can take all of that, and, and then you, you put your automated code on GitHub, right? And then from there, you can start building a QA portfolio. Um, and that would, that would definitely increase your chances of getting a QA job. Um, also make sure that you have a very, like that you have a resume that is explaining your accomplishments in the different roles that you have. Although I guess you have, maybe you haven't necessarily gotten one yet, but you can use your resume to highlight, um, your projects, your skills that you've, that you've gained. Right. Um, and your, your background, your education background, like list the, list the, um, where you're taking the software testing course. Right. And list that you have a degree in computer applications, because although they don't really teach you much about testing, it's still it's still helpful and applicable to your job search because companies prefer people with degrees. Right. Um, any like all the all the job applications we check, it says. It says um, a bachelor's degree in computer science or a related field. Right. So it's. Although they don't teach you much about software testing, it's still very useful. Um, so that's what I would say. And then it says, is it important to have theory knowledge or hands-on experience? I would say that it is way better to have hands-on experience because when you have hands-on experience, it forces you to research more and you end up gaining practical knowledge and theory knowledge because you understand how things work in theory, but you also understand how to apply them practically. So I would, I always vote more for hands-on experience over theory knowledge because with hands-on experience, you end up gaining the theory knowledge. And I'll give you a quick example. Um, like I said earlier, on Thursday, we are going to be going through Codecepts, uh, which, you know, never, I never really did any automation with JavaScript, but I am going to learn a lot more about automation just by going in and going hands-on, right? And then as I research, I'm going to be obtaining that theory knowledge, but also be able to um, understanding, a lot, understanding it a lot better by actually getting involved. And that's the same thing that happened with Citronella package. I read over the documentation and um, it made sense, but until I actually got my hands on it and working on it and everything like that, that's how I was able to get a better understanding of that um, amazing Python package for um, page object model and Selenium for Python. Um, so, and I, I think, and I think like, even you'll notice that in, in college, like you have a lot of theory knowledge, but un once you get out there in the real world, it's like, everything is, it's like, it's not, it's not what it seemed to be. Right. So that's what I would say to that. All right. Great question. Great question. Let's get rid of that one. One second, please. I have to plug in the laptop. Let's see that.
All right, I'm back. All right, so let's read this chat message. So Melissa says, test cases are typically written by members of the quality assurance team, right? But the devs can't write automated tests. Um, they, so the devs can write automated tests. Um, it's just that it's not the best use of their time, right? Um, and that's one of the most important things that we have to consider when working in a, um, working on a project, working in a company, right? Because there are, um, people are generally, um, smart, especially in the IT field. Um, and there's a lot of like cross functionality where people can, um, they can adapt, they can learn and everything like that. But what is the best use of the time, right? And I'll, I'll give you, I'll give you a quick example, right? I might be able to, um, when, I, when I'm creating videos, right? I, is the, like, if, if I had a team, right? Maybe the best use of my time is not necessarily creating the thumbnails or creating the description or editing the video, right? Maybe I could be doing something else. Um, but, you know, I don't have a team, so. But I am building one. Don't get me wrong. I'm building one, right? But you have you have to put the people in the best position to win based on their skill set. So the the um, the developers, the engineers, the best use of their time is to actually implementing the the code for the software to get that functionality going. All right. So that's so that, so that's so that's why like the 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 member the test cases are written by members of the QA team, um, but the devs, although they, they can, they have the knowledge on how to automate, but it's just not the best use of their time. So it's better to have the QA engineers do the automation so the devs can continue focusing on the actual software that they're building. All right. So great question. Great, great, great question. As always. All right, let's move on. We are almost done for tonight. Give me one more second, All right, so let's move on. We are almost done for tonight. All right. Get that done. And we are on question number seven. All right, cool. Um, Get that question up. All right. Another one. So this question says, how to identify false negative test in a testing set? And the question goes, hi guys, please share your real experience. How do you find false negative tests in your testing set? Or how do you control the appearance of false negative tests in your testing set? I read a couple of articles, but haven't had a clear understanding of the efficient ways it might be. All right, so let's get rid of that.
All right. So that so I, well, the first thing, right? I always, uh, I always call them like false positives, but are they false negatives? Or are they negative falses or positive negatives? I don't know. Let's see. So how do I identify false negative tests in a testing set? Um, the question's not entirely clear, but what I'm thinking you're referring to is you find a, so you're running test and it fails, but it, it failed because something with the test and not necessarily with the functionality of the website. So I'm going to take the question as that, right? Um, and let's start from the second one, right? How do you control the appearance of false negatives in your tests? Um, well, you need to optimize your test so that they kind of like they handle these false negative tests um, in a gracious way. What do I mean by a gracious way, right? Um, you need to implement like either retries or like if an actual test actually goes and it fails, you need to implement a retry, right? Um, and what's a retry? So it's saying if this actual test failed, let's run it again um, to see if on the second time it's going to pass. Usually like with these false negatives right when they fail um it's a, like it's a flaky test and then when you run it again right now it has a um now it's gonna it should pass right if it passed if it fails two times in a row then something's like you need better logic in the code um but so yeah, so that's how i like so that's like the way i would handle that in the testing set but the question is, we didn't start our timer. That's the question. No, that is not the question. So the question is, so that's how it can control the appearance, right? Uh, if it fails the first time, then um, I say run the ones that failed, run all the tests that failed a second time, right? And if they pass, then we're good to go. If they fail, we need more investigation, right? Um, and that's how I would control the appearance of false negative tests in the testing set. Now, how do you find the false negatives? Um, well, you find them because like you review the results, you see the ones that fail. But the question is, why are you having false negatives? And especially if it's a lot of false negatives, right? You need to be able to account for that. You need to be able to handle that. And what is a way to handle that? So let's say in the actual code, right? Like you, um, something that that WebDriver is very, very popular for is having um, stale elements, right? So what I've done with stale elements in the past is I have um, I have um, like written into the code, like a retry inside the code itself for stale elements. So let's say you get a stale element, right? And now he says, okay, handle that exception for the stale element and try it again X amount of times. Because usually what happens is when you get a stale element, you refresh the browser and then it, it passes, right? So either you need, you're not handling the timing right, or you can write um, a affluent wait where it says, wait for element not to be stale. Right, or you put a couple of those ways where you're like, wait for element to be visible, wait for element to be clickable, wait for element not to be stale. Those are some options. Like I, I've I've integrated those into um, my testing so that I can avoid those false negatives because it is super annoying that when you run the test again, it passes, but you like you have a you have a bunch of failures because of something something stupid. Right, it, it's super annoying. Um, so. I would say those are two of the key ways to do it is handling retries on a global test level. So like, let's say the test actually failed, right? You want to retry, you want to gather all the failed tests and you want to retry those, right? I, I know I did that in, um, when I was in Selenium with Java um, and using TestNG, like you can, you can write a retry listener that'll gather all the failed tests and it'll run them again. And so, and the way that that worked is, right? Um, I was using a test case management software. And what happened is with the retry logic, it will still record the test that failed. But when you go to review the actual results, it'll show you like the latest run, which will show you that everything, um, everything that um, failed was from the retry. If it failed a second time, then we really need to investigate. If it failed the first time, 
And then the second time it passes, it says a little, might be a little flaky, but it's not like something that we just drop everything and see what's going on. Right. That's with the retry logic. But then also more in a code level is that you want to handle your exceptions graciously, especially for still elements, especially for element not clickable or, or element not visible. You know, and, and that's another thing about the element not clickable. Sometimes you have where you might have a pop up that that shows up and then it can't click on it. So you need to be able to handle those type of pop ups, um, you know, all those different things Like you need to be able to handle those 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 situations that come up to make your test more reliable and you reduce the false negatives that occur. All right. So great question. All right. Uh, let's move on to our last and final question of the night. And And we had a minute left on that one. How about that? One more for that. All right, let's reset our timer. And let me get the question. Ooh, this is gonna be a good one. So let's go with that. Another one. So the headline for this one is my company's client offered me a job that is four. What? Four times more paying. What? Is that right? So let's get into it. So the company I work is, hmm, let's start that over. All right. So the company I work at is basically overloading me with work. They gave me a lot of work to complete in very, very, very little time. The pay is average as well. So my company basically finds rich, rich businessmen from first world countries and then offers them our services. And for that, they hire us, people from third world countries, so that they can pay us peanuts of what clients have paid them. <laughs> All right, and it continues. Anyways, in T ways, I was on a video call with one of our clients and he started asking me personal questions about my salary, to which I told him how much I was being paid. He was surprised that, I, that I'm being paid four to six times less than what he is paying the company for my service. He offered me so he offered that I should leave my job and directly work for him. He is a great person. Otherwise, I'm really tempted to now. I'm just confused and can't stop feeling bad that if I accept his offer, I'd be basically betraying my company. Am I right to feel this way? Hmm. Is he right for feeling this way? A true mystery indeed. So let's get this question off the screen. And let's talk about it. So timer on. Oh, I'm going to say it's right. So. When, when um, companies contract overseas, um, 
it's like they, the reason that they contract overseas is because it's, it's cheaper than getting the employees in the quote unquote first world countries. Um, it's cheaper to get them in the third world countries. And, um, and then there's like, they don't have to pay like the benefits and all that type of stuff. Right. So now that the, um, so the company that you work for, they're paying you peanuts, um, of what the clients have paid them. So let me, let me first, let me, um, put it this way. Right. Because to be honest with you, like there's, there's that same complaint here in the States as well. Like, Oh, um, we're getting paid peanuts, right? Maybe not peanuts, maybe almonds or roasted cashews, right? We're getting paid very little to what, um, compared to what the client is paying, right? So an, an example, right? You might be a QA engineer and you're making, um, let's say $90,000 a year, right? Um, and you are um and you, you guys have multiple clients who are paying over a million dollars a year for your for your service right um for, to your company right so here, here's what you have to consider um number one the company that you work for is taking the risk right they are also providing you a lot of the infrastructure and and structure that you need right uh because they are making sure that you get paid on time, although it might be in peanuts, right? But you're getting paid on time. Um, they are they are taking on the risk, right? And I think a lot of people um, all over the world, especially like even especially in first world countries, especially here in the United States, they do not see that they, they do not see the risk that companies take on a daily basis in order to be able to um, provide for the clients, provide for the employees and everything like that. Um, and you don't like, although, although you say that, um, they are paying, they are paying, how much did you say? Three to four times or so you're getting, so the company's being paid four to six times, um, more than what, so you're being paid 46 times less than what he's paying for your service. So with that being said, um, your company is, um, like I said, taking on the risk, right? They have to, they have to be profitable as well. Like, I don't know how much, I, I don't know how you calculate that um, in order to be able to provide you and other people a job. So now here comes to the real part, right? Should you leave your job and directly work for that person? So, here is how I'm going to answer that question, right? Outside of, outside of like feeling bad and um, betraying your company that you work for, right? Is if you make that move, you become your own company and you take on all the risk for yourself, right? It, everything becomes on you. Um, and now you have to manage to make sure that you do get paid from this person. And now what if um, that person goes out of business? They don't know. They no longer leave, need your services and, and all that type of stuff. Right. So now you take on that, that burden on yourself to be able to provide for yourself. And do you think that if you were to leave your current company to go to work directly for this person and now things don't work out that they're going to take you back. Right. Um, and, and I'm not, I'm not saying that it's a bad move for you to make, or I'm not saying it's a good move to make. I'm just offering perspective into the, when, when you make these type of moves on number one, going to work directly for a client. Um, sometimes it works out, depends on the size of the client. But if, if, if that person is hiring you on directly, you got to be able to manage, um, the, the cost and everything like that. Another question is, um, do you get any type of benefits working for the current company that you work for? Uh, or do you pay like everything out of pocket? Uh, like you said, you're working in a third world country. I don't know what they offer there, um, if anything, right? But I'm, I'm just, I just want to put everything into perspective that um, you got to be careful with your temptations, right? I, like, uh, uh, like it says in the Bible, like, do not lead us into temptation. Um, and you're tempted right now. You have to look at it from a holistic perspective. Uh, I'm not saying, like, if, if you can get more money, right? And, and if your question was, if this was your question, another company 
is offering to pay me more money, right? Should I leave my current company? Then emphatically, I would say yes, because, um, but the question is, are you ready to become your own business, right? Like Jay-Z said, I'm a business man, right? Um, you're not just a businessman, you're a business man. And if you're ready to take on that risk and whatever comes after that, that's on you, right? It, whether it works out or not, or it doesn't work out, that's totally on you. Um, no one's going to feel sympathy for you. No one's going to feel sorry for you. You're not going to be able to crawl back to that job that you were and say, well, I was wrong because if you, because technically you are betraying the company if you were to leave them for a client and you got you to gotta check to make sure that there's no contractual agreements in there as well on your end as well uh, as on your company's client. And because if they post their workers, right, then that can cause you, um, that can cause you significant harm and cause that other company significant harm as well. And your company is going to be all right. Uh, I'll give you a quick example. Uh, years ago at a company, uh, we wanted to bring on one of our contractors to be a full-time employee, but there in the clause, it said that um, our company was unable to hire one of their employees um, with, I think you had to wait like a six months to a year before we could actually do that um, because that, that's their money. That's your bottom line. Um, so that's what, that, that's what I want you to understand and to consider. Um, I, I, I can't really say whether you should um, accept his offer and betray your company. Cause I mean, um, because at the end of the day, we all have to do what's best for us. Um, like I said the other day, we, have our best we, we must have our best interest in mind because no one else will right now the question is is it in your best interest it depends um it just depends i i, I don't know the strength of that company uh to say whether you should or not but um and i don't know the, reper the repercussions that could come with if you were just to leave that company for a client right if you're leaving it for a competitor that's sort of different but if you're leaving it for a client that is very very hard to say all right so that is that um yeah that's what i got for that one um be careful and one thing i'll add to that you you gotta be careful when you're dealing with the clients um because you don't you don't know if that's a even a setup right to see to test to see what you would do are you trustworthy because what what if what, what if like now if that client if that client sees that oh you were so easy to, to turn your back on who you actually work for, maybe they lose confidence. And it's like, it, it, it's like when a, um, it's like when someone is in a relationship and then they, they leave that relationship for the person that they cheated with. And then they get surprised when that person cheats on them too. Like, come on. Right. So you gotta, you gotta be careful. Um, you got, you want to do things the right way, you know? Um, but yeah, like that's, like I said, it's not to say whether you should leave or not. You just got to be careful because at the end of the day, you're putting your livelihood on the line with whatever you decide, right? So getting paid more, definitely think it's um, in your best interest, but leaving in the wrong way and doing shady business, um, that is not right. And you got to definitely be careful how you navigate the field because you also don't want to be blackballed, right? Um, and to think that, and trust me, blackballing happens in every single industry. So don't think that um, it won't happen here, especially like in a third world country where companies talk, uh, especially like if you're working for a contracting company and they can, you know, I don't know what can happen. So be careful. And that is that. So let's get back over here. We are done for tonight. So let's get this off the screen. And let's wrap it up. I want to thank everyone, and I mean everyone, for being here tonight. We are done with our Q&A session. It was amazing having you. And one more shout out to Sean for being in the chat with us tonight. And for being a new subscriber to the channel, you are very much appreciated. All right. And of course, to our good friend, Melissa, for being in the chat with us. 
We appreciate you. I appreciate you. We the best. And if you have not done so yet, please like the video, share the video to somebody who will find it useful. Subscribe to the channel and click the notification bell for notifications when we go live and when we drop our videos throughout the week. Oh, you saw that. Let's put that up. Thank you. And I don't know if you saw this, but look. the hoodie and click on the back yep how about that anyways we are wrapping up for tonight and we our gone thank you so much everybody for tuning in and i will see you guys on thursday night for our software explorations where we will be going through Code steps. But until next time, my friends. You might think that getting into the IT field is impossible without a computer science degree, but Tech Coach Ralph is here to prove you wrong. Get ready for some jaw dropping revelations on how to break into this lucrative industry. Listen up, tech enthusiasts. Are you ready to break through into the IT field, but feel like you need a computer science degree to make it happen? Think again. Tech Coach Ralph has some exclusive, mind-blowing secrets to share with you. Get ready to be blown away by his jaw-dropping revelations on how to break into the tech industry without a computer science degree. So get your notepad ready, because Tech Coach Ralph is going to change your life forever. Buckle up, because you're about to embark on a journey to success in the IT field. Oh, yeah.